All right, let's get started here. A few minutes past the hour. Again, big warm welcome to anyone attending. Thanks again for taking some time out of your day um, for joining us here with From Chaos to Calm, Business Strategies and Tax Credits for Growth. Uh, my name is Rich Cardi. Great to meet you all. I'm here, obviously, with Amanda, which I believe most of you uh, know out there. Uh, Amanda, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Rich. Yeah. And um, me and Amanda have been speaking for the past couple of months about a couple of projects and working together. Um, had some great conversations. So excited to kind of share some of our side of the house with you and um, some great credits that are potentially out there. Um, you know, a little bit about myself, I'll be, you know, here working with Layden on the strategic development side. Um, and I've been in consulting with financial services for over 10 years in a few different facets. But uh, I think we will learn here today on a super high level is just some of the great credits that we can hopefully, you know, find or potentially pursue and, um, you know, the underutilization of some of these four groups, you know, it's over 90% of small and mid-sized businesses in the United States. So uh, thanks again for joining. And um, with that being said, we'll kind of get kicked off here and dive right in. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. I'm going to get started in talking about kind of that entrepreneurial journey. You know, you've heard it before. It's that roller coaster where you've got the highs and you're cheering yourself on and you can do no wrong, but it's the lows. Who's in your corner at that time when you maybe made the wrong decision? Maybe you did something to an employee that you maybe, maybe you have animosity towards your business or you're not quite getting the revenue in your business that you want, that's really when you wanna know who's in your corner. And what I'm going to share with you today in my portion of this is just kind of an overall view of a business and how we can start tightening up small areas of business to increase your bottom line. So a lot of times when I meet people, you're when you're looking at your financial statements. So let's say, let's look at our financial statements. What I say to people is, how do you feel about those financial statements? <laughs> right in the chat too, uh, let's be interactive here. There's just a few of us on the call. Um, how do you feel about your financial statements? Is this a, I don't even know what they are, or, uh, you know, I, I have to do them for taxes. A lot of times is what I get from people. And it, uh, I see we have Jackie on the line. She is an accountant and bookkeeper. So that's great to have her here. Thanks for joining us. And um, really what accountants do or bookkeepers do is turning your actions into numbers. And then what we need to do as business owners is turn those numbers back into actions so that we can take a the point of where you are now and draw the line to where you want to be. So that's what I'm going to be showing you today. And that's the base of all of my work. I'm looking at three numbers in the, in that income statement or that PNL and how we can put strategies behind what you're already doing to increase that bottom line. But first, let me tell you how I got there. So I'm going to pop into the way back machine and bring you to August 2018, and I wrote this passage on my Facebook page that you can see here on this slide. In the review mirror of life, I will be able to look back on this time and see these experiences helped me shape my heart's desire in grace and in perfect ways. So four months after I wrote that post, my life changed forever. Through a series of decisions that I had made over the course of six years, I had lost my bakery business. To me, this was a huge public failure. I had launched this business from one single farmer's market booth and bootstrapped it to a brick and mortar retail location with a wholesale manufacturing facility. And we employed 15 people. On that August day, I had four maxed out credit cards and an empty 401k. I was literally out of cash. But the reason why I'm sharing this with you today is now I'm sitting in a brand new car, a Hyundai Ionic hybrid to be exact. 
And I get to stare at that review mirror and say to the reflection, you're okay. You made it to the other side. Over the course of the last three years, I've dissected every piece of where I went wrong. And more importantly, found a passion for disseminating that, disseminating that information so that no business owner fails as I did. And in this presentation, we're just going to touch on a few things, but it all is crucial information. And there's so much more I want to share with you. Really, I could talk for four hours, but that would, and it wouldn't be boring to you, I promise. <laughs> In that, um, had I had this information, the bakery story may have had a different ending. So I'd like to dive in and I'm going to start with the 80-20 rule. A lot of us know about the 80-20 rule in maybe dieting. So you get to eat chocolate 20% of the time and 80% of the time you stick to vegetables or a low fat meat. In business, the 80-20 rule is slightly different in that what it's stating is the 20% of what you do each day, 20% of your activities is generating 80% of your income. Or maybe you've heard it in this way of that 20% of your customers are generating 80% of your revenue. What I'm going to do now is show, hold up a magnifying glass to the 20%. And this comprises of the 20% of um, activities that generate 80% of your revenue in your business. So this five part framework is like I'm holding up a magnifying glass for you. If you focus in on these top five areas and don't worry about all the words in the middle of it, it isn't even a comprehensive list, but it's an illustration of what I mean in each of those areas. But when you focus on these five areas relentlessly, you will then have a successful business. And what we're doing today is speaking about profit through Rich and what he does and um, the profit piece is when you make shifts in that area, that doesn't hit your whole income statement. It's not um, subject to your COGS. It's not subject to your overhead. It's directly hitting that bottom line. So that's a very important distinction between um, you know, revenue generating activities versus the profit activities. And then just to for today's sake, so that you can walk away with something from me, I want to also show you um, a foundation strategy that we can start utilizing today. But to prove the point of um, like digital marketing, so with this five part framework, what I want to show you is uh, where overwhelm comes from. When you're looking at your business and you're like, what should I do to grow my business? What we hear from people is, oh, get, put up an ad, put an ad in the local paper or um, do social media. And what I want to illustrate next is where your overwhelm comes from and what should I do to grow my business? So I'm going to that lead section, the orange sec section, and I'm going to pull out digital marketing. So in this imaginary business that I'm explaining to you, let's say digital marketing is where they want their primary focus to be in lead generating activity. Of digital marketing, there are at least 25 different ways to do digital marketing. Then within each of these ways of doing digital marketing, there are tools and tactics that you can deploy. So up in the upper right-hand corner, there's the social media and then Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. There's dozens of ways to deploy a social media strategy. Most companies start in the tools and tactics. So when you put the connection dots between, am I creating an, inst an Instagram to create leads in my business? Do you see how that might change your strategy? Or 
if you're looking at social media, I like to use myself as an example. So my Instagram, no one's going to my Instagram and being like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to work for this person. And they sign up for my thousands of dollars a month, um, my highest price uh, package, right? I'm not saying really that much thing is stuff that's different out there in the world, um, though I do try. But for me, a the social media is a conversion strategy. Really, it's people are seeing me out in the world, do me doing an interview or doing a presentation like this. And they're saying, oh, wow, I like the way that she talks. I like her story. I like what she's um, per, how she's presenting, but I want to see if she's real. And so they go and check out my social media channels. So for me, the social media is a conversion tool. You see where I'm going with that? Write a one in the chat. For most companies, then my point here is that we're starting in the tools and tactics. And really what I want you to do is start thinking of these higher, these five, this five part framework and looking at lead strategies holistically. And what can I do in, in order to increase leads in my business that I might be doing or getting better returns on? Then before we move into Rich's part of this, conversation, I would like to show you how small shifts in your business can make a huge difference. So in this calculator, you're seeing my five-part framework in a slightly different view so that I can show you the power of exponential growth. And to illustrate that, that just means small tweaks in many areas in these five different areas can make a huge difference. So we're taking numbers from an income statement and we're putting in there to draw the map from where you are today to where you're going so that we can work together on these strategies to tighten up what you're doing. So in this example, you're seeing that the baseline here, I'm just gonna read down that column. The baseline is for this imaginary business, we're bringing in a thousand leads. From those leads, 25% of them are converting. So that means this business is bringing in 250 customers. From those 250 customers, they're buying from this business 10 times. The average price per unit is $100. So $250,000 in total revenue is coming into this business. From that, then the profits, the bottom line is to a 25% margin. So this business owner is taking home $62,500. Sounds like a pretty typical one person small business. Now, if we go over to the 10% increase here, you're gonna see we're from leads, we're going from 1,000 leads to 1,100. How can we make it where we get just 100 more leads into the business? Conversions, we're going to tighten up that conversion rate and go from 25 to 27.5. So now instead of 250 customers, we have 302. We're going to convince our, these customers to buy from us one more time. And then through value add and ways of what you're looking at, what you're already doing, we're going to look at your pricing structure and increase prices from 100 to $110. We're not doing any of this blindly. There's strategies behind it, but now we're going to see from the total revenue piece, we're going from $250,000 to $365,000 over that. Then in profitability, we want to move that 10% from 25% to 27.5. We now have a six-figure business. Now what happens if we're able to increase by 50%? We're going to go from 1,000 leads to 1,500 leads. 27% conversion rate to 37.5% conversion rate. 250 customers to 562 customers. From transactions, we're gonna get people to buy from us five more times, so 15. The pricing work that we do, we move our pricing from 100 to 150. We now have a business that is generating one over $1 million. And from that million dollars, we have our profit margin. So that's 37.5 as well. 
we nearly have half a million dollars in this bottom line. The power of compounding. Imagine what can happen if you tighten up areas in these five areas and you can then have a bottom line that looks a little bit more healthy so that you can live a vibrant or at least a livable wage, right? So, but how can we do that? Well, let's first start with, I kind of hate this question. I'm a really bad networker. I don't know if you all agree, but networking is one of the things that is the hardest for me. And it was hardest for me because I hate this question. So what do you do? I'm like, oh, so boring. Can we, do we really need to talk about this? But yes, we do <laughs> because that's what networking is for. And you know, it applies to everyone, but you didn't come to this presentation thinking, gee, I wonder what this person does. You don't care about me really at the end of the day, you don't care about me. You don't really care about Layton or rich or my business. What you care about and the reason why you're attending right now is because you have a problem that you want to solve. There's something that is weighing on you and you want to know how to do something. So you've come here with a problem that you don't want, and there's a result that you want, but you don't have. So you're going to want to write this down. So I hope you have a pen and paper ready. Here you go. I know it hurts. It surely stings to me is that no one really cares what you do or about your business at all. Really, these are the things that are going on in their head. What do I need to know for what or what can you do for me? What can I or what do I have to do? How long will it take and how much does it cost? It's really what's going through people's heads when they're meeting you. In my networking example. The other thing is who can I connect you to? I want to know exactly what I can do with knowing you. So this is what your answer could look like. I help blank to blank without blank. It's um, oh, this slide is slightly off, but I help one is your target market. I help blank to this problem you solve without blank. Number three is your, um, the results that you, or what they avoid, the pain they avoid while getting it. So let me give you a few examples just really quickly to illustrate this. So my husband and I own a landscaping company becomes we create beautiful landscaping for busy professionals that makes their home the envy of the neighborhood so that they can avoid heat and spend time doing what they love. Do you see how that just increases the awareness of what these people do? Oh, okay. Do you see that their target market, they, they're not talking about the name of their company. They're not talking to people who are looking or price shopping. They're looking for people who want their yard to look amazing. I own a gluten-free bakery, which I used to, <laughs> becomes I design or I help the people of Carlton celebrate life's moments with tasty treats. Every person at the party can enjoy regardless of food intolerances. And lastly, this can work for your employees as well. I am an engineer at AMCE Corporation becomes I design high tech fuel systems for cars. So they burn less gas, which means car owners like you save thousands of dollars each year and help heal our planet. So with the, uh, what the strategy is, is market dominating position. What we're doing is separating you from everyone else that's selling what you sell. And how you do that is imagine there are 10 accountants or for me, 10 business coaches that are standing in a line. How do I have my customer pick me? You do that 
with three things. I want to know what your customers want to know. They want to know, do they, does she understand me? Does she understand my problem? Can I trust her? And can she really help me? So when we enter our conversations with our potential, uh, our prospects with that in mind and speaking to how we are different, not necessarily with jargon, but more about the results of the, that you can provide them without the pain that they're going through now. What is it costing you in time and money to keep having this problem? That's what will really accelerate your business. And that is a foundational strategy, market dominating position. So with that, that's the my part of it, but we're going to really shift over to profits and talk about tax stuff <laughs> because I am the worst person to talk to you about that. Um, and Rich is an expert here. So Rich, can I hand the microphone to you? Please do. Great job. <laughs> you got I it. Appreciate it. I'll advance let, the slide. Let, there you let, go. Let me give that a stab there. We at Layton make taxes fun and exciting as we find uh, underutilized funds to put into your business year after year and grow, grow, grow. <laughs> there you go. Without? Uh, without you doing the work, we take that on looking at your day to day. How's that? Nice. That's awesome. Good work. And I should have done else? a little more homework to be more poetic than your examples, but um, <laughs> I gave it a shot there. Um, those of you that are, are watching, you do have access to turn on, on your mic um, and getting live with us if you want, and then um, turning on your camera if you'd like. Um, but if you do have an elevator pitch you want us to look at, go ahead and put it in the chat uh, or raise your hand and we'll go ahead and um, do that at the end. But Rich, let's talk about taxes. Let's do it. Well, thanks again, Amanda. That's awesome. Um, I think I actually took some things away from that as well. So um, just another great conversation and some tips there that are awesome um, from you. Um, all the way from the West Coast, which I imagine most of our audience is out there. Um, you know, we are based in Boston, headquartered here uh, since 2017. Uh, we do have an office actually in San Francisco and Arizona now as we are continuing to grow and, um, you know, find credits for businesses. So um, a little bit about our group, a little bit more in depth is, you know, we've been in the business for over 25 years, starting in Europe. Um, and our founders found the opportunity here in the U.S. Um, in 2017. So like I said, you know, we started with four or five employees that year. We're already over 200 and continuing to hire. So we just, it's the cool thing. And what I love about working here is we have so much experience and wisdom through our consultants and staff. Um, but we have a really cool feel and know, you know, the potential and opportunity that we can help businesses with, with some of these tax credits. Um, so you can see a few stats up there, you know, with, with our group. Um, but, you know, the big one, obviously, as you can see highlighted is, you know, last year alone with some of these credits, we found over 1.5 billion for companies. And like I mentioned at the top, you know, 90% of the groups don't know that they're there and it's something they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, that's what we're looking to do. And I'll talk about a couple big ones that are a little bit relevant or may fall into your category. So you may know, uh, so you can move forward there, Amanda. The first one is the research and development tax credit. Um, you know, this really changed in 2015 through the PATH Act. And what that really was meant to do, you know, within, within the country is, you know, make sure that we're leaders of innovation and change and, you know, being, being those leaders in the world of making sure we're on top for anything that is, you know, created or improved upon. And um, again, like I said, we were founded in 2017 shortly after that. And it, it just expanded a lot of the industries that would qualify in this sense. So it's not people hear research and development. And, you know, again, maybe the boring side of the taxes of someone in a white lab coat doing, you know, doing their research and experimentation. But again, with that change in 2015, we have now served over 70 industries um, 
you know, from examples of physical therapy, dentistry, breweries and winery. Um, it's something that we're able to help and put in, again, into place year after year. And again, I'm not going to go too fine into the details with it, but I think it's more so just the educational piece that it's, there's a lot more of this out there nowadays since that change. Um, and, you know, we, we try to work with CPAs that maybe might not be able to take that, you know, service on, um, or, you know, other groups that, you know, be, be looking for that. And, um, you know, it's, it's really cool. Some of the examples that we talk to some of our consultants each day about, um, and again, what the, what the credit will be able to do is we'll be able to reduce some of your income or payroll tax liability. Um, if, you know, maybe it's smaller or it's something, um, you know, something that you don't want to take advantage of this year, you can carry them forward. And if you were selling the business, it's going to increase your business valuation. So that's a cool thing as well um, with, you know, finding any money that you can put back into your business for certain purposes. Next slide. And again, what, how we do this, and again, this isn't necessarily something you need to know. We'll work with you on that. And again, we take that on ourselves. is it's a four part test. And again, what you can see there is a new or improved process, technique, formula. I, I mean, a, a example I couldn't believe when I heard about this was a golf course where they changed the design of a, uh, the sand bunker next to a green because the wind was blowing it out and the time spent um, in experimentation, I guess, with architects and engineers behind the scenes, they were able to you know, offset some of the cost of changing this, where that went. So really just some cool examples um, all across the board, but that was one of recent that I hear of, but we use this test to do that. You can move forward, Amanda. And again, what is looked at you know, through this R&D credit? So again, we're looking at um, a group that has salaries involved with um, you know, so, some of this um, activity, uh, maybe there's subcontracted costs or a 1099 that worked on it. Um, and the lab expense, always, I always laugh when I see that because you know, we try to dismiss the white lab coat myth and misnomer, but obviously it still is included. Um, but other raw materials and supplies that may have been used for research can also be you know applied so software as well um just some you know a high level again this is what we do with this type of thing we try to simplify it take it out of your hands through you know a quick initial call and move through maybe a little bit more of an in-depth call with our consultants and they're the ones that really you know separate us and specialize only on credits that's what they do and can look into your day-to-day -to, -day to find that and go to the next slide so there's a couple examples I like to share um, on the R&D side. This would be a software company, as you can see, a few things to think about. And I like to point out at least is, you know, that mid middle bullet point, the interview time spent with the stakeholders. It was really only about two hours that they spent from a couple calls and gathering some information, taking a look at what was there. And just by two hours alone, they found a claim for $430,000. So clearly your ROI on time spent on some of these credits with us, I would imagine is well worth it. Now, in terms of sizes, we do work with groups that may only have a few employees all the way up to um, the several hundreds. So it's not to say there's a you know, core group we look at. We work with all sizes and groups. Um, but again, you know, if there's no credit found, there's no problem. There's no you know, fee associated with that or anything along those lines. So it's really just making people aware and taking a look at what's there as well. You can go to the next, uh, next study here. And then you can see, you know, biotech, another great um, industry for us. They had about 45 technical employees. We take a look at, again, their wages. Again, another one only spent about two hours with us. And again, we found about over $600,000 for them. Not too shabby, um, I would say. So. Um, again, with this claim, what we're able to find, we make sure it's worthwhile. And again, we try to make it as seamless as possible um, for some of these things that you know, hopefully you or someone you might know um, are doing on a day to day. Next slide. 
All right. So the next credit that I'll bring up is a little bit more relevant to, you know, where we are today in the world. It would be the employee retention credit. This was put into place um, with, with the pandemic for any group that kept employees um, and, you know, maybe was forced to shut down partially um, or full time. And again, maybe um, had a loss in gross receipts. And what we do, or I should say the way it's calculated is looked at as a benchmark year of 2019. And then we could take a look at 2020 and 2021 um, to you know, see where you stand on that side. And hopefully we were able to, again, find a way to maximize the credit based on the employees there. Again, we can find a maximum up to 26,000 per employee. But again, we can do this by quarter. It's not per year, which most people think. And you'll find out in a second as well with a couple of slides, there's a couple of other myths and misnomers that might not necessarily be true and there could be some money out there. Um, so again, a nice one there. Again, I kind of jumped ahead, but you know, we take a look at the gross receipts and how your business had done. And again, we can look at this retroactively. I think the big thing with this one is, again, it's not gonna be around forever. So we're, we kind of have a push to try to take a look now before they do make changes. You know, legislation is always changing, especially in the tax world. And our team's on top of this. We have a full team looking at what would change. So actually at the beginning um, of the pandemic, they've actually made changes where people are now more qualified than before. So if you have looked at it, you may even qualify now than if you have. So again, never hurts to look. And I think the biggest myth is people say, hey, well, I got a PPP loan. Uh, I'm not gonna qualify. I heard that from somewhere. Absolutely could be true. However, like I mentioned with the quarters, what we're able to do is back out the PPP loan, see the timeline that it was spent on or the amount of employees, see how that was spread out and maybe we can qualify for two or three quarters. Again, when we look at this, we make sure that it's gonna be worthwhile in terms of the money that would be coming back in the credit. Also, um, you know, it's something that we wanna make sure it works for you. So. Um, again, not only the money, but if it's not, if we don't have enough there, then, you know, we're not going to pursue it at that point. So, you know, we understand time, time is time is money. So, um, again, we'll take a look at what's there and what we can qualify through that. Next. Yeah. So, again, a couple mis misconceptions, um, you know, people say, hey, I'm not profitable or have a tax liability, which would, you know, be a little bit more incorporated with our R&D tax. The ERC tax is not, doesn't have anything to do with that. It's a payroll tax. So again, it would be something we could qualify you for. Um, another big one, again, we already talked about the PPP. Um, it would be, you know, maybe you, maybe you used a payroll provider or someone else to do this. And it's not to say what they did is wrong or they said it, you wouldn't qualify. The biggest difference for Layton um, is we are specialists in this. This is what we do. Um, you know, it's, we're able to maximize it or not make it as complicated. And we build in an audit defense as well, because you hear, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I'm a little wary that, you know, people are taking a look at it. By all means, any of the work that our consultants do, again, if it's the ERC, if it's the R&D or any credit that we put together, we build in 16 hours of, of audit defense. Our consultants stand by that because as much as we'll maximize a credit, we would never cross a line. Um, I think, since we've been uh, look uh, since 2017, there's been a couple inquiries. There's never been an audit. No one's really worried after talking to our consultants. So, again, audits happen, but again, we do it the right way. We have a team that builds it in for you, so you're not going to be flagged. Um, whereas other um, other groups may potentially have to pursue uh, go down that road. I guess. Next slide. So again, we'd, you know, I don't want to go too far into it, but we're taking a look at anyone who, you know, had salary, wages, tips, and so forth with the ERC. Next slide. And again, again, I jumped ahead a little bit, but the changes in legislation, they are changing. So, you know, again, the ERC is one to try to take advantage of now while you can, hopefully. Um, it, again, it, it'll be, I'm not saying tomorrow it's going away, but I'm sure they'll be looking at, uh, you know, making changes to it sooner rather than later. Next slide. And I just have a couple other slides with a case study. 
So the education industry, especially the private um, schools per se, um, they obviously were affected. And this is, would be an example of taking a look at the gross receipts, again, compared with that benchmark year of 2019. They did have a PPP loan. And so what we did is we looked at the first two quarters of 2021. We were able to um, find a great credit for them by you know, really doing our homework. And that was over a million dollars. So very, very impactful for them. Um, when again, they had a PPP loan and we you know, dove into it a little bit more. Next slide. And then hospitality, obviously another industry you know, impacted by the ongoing pandemic. Fingers crossed, we see some light here. Um, but again, you know, I don't need to read word for word again. It's just, you can see the um, benefit and the, and the credit that is available just by going through and taking a look at what they have. So um, again, happy to help in that sense if, if, if uh, you think you might qualify or anyone else um, you might know. Next slide. Awesome. So that kind of, again, I wanted to keep it super high level, just kind of give you an overview of some of the two big credits that we've been working on a little bit more relevant right now. Uh, we do have other credits we do work on with um, sales and use audit. We have energy efficiency credits coming out. Um, so there's a lot more that we do, but in the credit world and this uh, exciting tax uh, industry, you know, we, we want to be able to help who we can and, you know, work with, we work with a lot of other CPAs, partner, uh, partners across the country. Someone like Amanda, who, you know, we talked about some strategies like a webinar and just getting the word out to see what we can do to help and, you know, put money to that they can reinvest into their business, continue to grow. Um, another great example I had is um, with the R&D, a group was outsourcing engineers internationally they found out that they did qualify. As they continue to grow, they were able to hire people within the US. And even though it was a little bit more expensive on the salary side, they offset it with the credit and continue to diversify and grow. So that was you know, one of my favorite ones that we did over the past couple of months. It was owned by two brothers and they're over the moon once we kind of find it, found it. So in any case, you know, we're always happy to help. If they're, I'm happy to you know, take a few minutes and see if there are any mm -hmm. questions today can unmute yeah. or put them in the chat and you know whether it's for amanda or me feel free to put them in the chat and so, if we can answer them great and if not you know we'd love to set up a meeting yeah so i wanted 